have a little bit of a Bible study for you guys today. And we're going to, our main text is going to be in Luke chapter 14. And what we're going to study out is a little bit of what uh, scholars call the journey section of the book of Luke. So the journey section in the book of Luke starts in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, where the Bible reads, Jesus resolutely sets out to Jerusalem. And that, that marks the starting point of Jesus heading towards his death. And what's interesting about that is Jesus knew what was about to happen, but he was resolute to get the job done. And Jesus knew his time was short, but he was laser focused. You know, earlier in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent, uh, sent out the 12 to go preach. But in Luke chapter 10, he kind of scales up the ministry here. And, and this is where we see that Jesus sends out the 72. And uh, they, these disciples go off and then they spread the gospel to, to, to really complete the mission that God had set out for them. And Luke chapter 10, verse 2, you can write this down. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. See, God, when he looks at the world, he sees a bunch of men and women ready to make the decision to follow him. The only challenge that God has is there aren't enough people going out into the field. So he starts with the 12, then he sends out the 72. And Jesus' heart before going to the cross was to take care of people and to spread the good news as much as possible. He commissions the 72 to bring peace to people's households, to heal the sick, and to tell them about the kingdom of God. Let's take a look at Luke chapter, five, Luke chapter 10, verse 5 to 9 real quick. Amen. You know what? I think I'm good. You can preach the Bible on that one. chapter 10 starting verse 5 it says when you enter the house first say peace peace uh to this house if a man of peace is there your peace will rest on him if not it will return to you stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages do not move around from house to house so jesus commissions them bring peace spread the gospel teach about the kingdom Luke 10, verse 25 to 37, the Bible reads, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A, a, a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side but a samaritan as he traveled came where the man was and when he saw him he took pity on him he went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine then he put the man on his own donkey took him to an end and took care of him the next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper look after him he said and when i return i will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. See, Jesus shows us that through, through this Samaritan that we need to love God and to love people. See, what was common in that age, people would say, man, I love God. 
And that was their primary focus, but they didn't really love people that much. And Jesus shows the Jews an example that, hey, you saw a Levite, you saw a priest. They all walked by this man who was beaten down in distress, but a Samaritan. And guys, to give you some historical context, the, the, the Samaritans weren't really valued. As a matter of fact, the Jews had a lot of prejudice against the Samaritan. But Jesus uses this example to admonish them to recognize, hey, we have to have a deeper love for others. Don't tone there, but in Luke 41 to 42, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees because their lack of love and compassion on people. And my question to us today, do we have love? Do we have the compassion that Jesus calls us to imitate from him? And Luke 13, verse 11 to 13, Jesus heals, heals the bent over woman on the Sabbath. And even on, and even on his way to his death, Jesus was all about God and all about peop- people. Jesus could have had every excuse. Guys, I'm about to die. I'm emotionally distressed. I need to take a break. I need to fall back. But instead of shrinking back, he pushed forward and gave to people. Guys, I can think of so many times in my life when I'm struggling. I, I'm one of those people when I struggle, my temptation is to isolate. It's to shrink back. People text me, I hide. But Jesus' heart's like, no, I'm not going to hide. I'm going to give more. Turn to Luke 14, chapter 34. In Luke 14, verse 34, the Bible says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? The title of our lesson, Pass the Salt. See, uh, salt is mentioned 40 times in the Bible, Old Testament and New. Salt represents a covenant. A covenant of friendship. It, it, it represents loyalty. It represents faithfulness. Salt is used for pur- purification. Salt is also used to season food. You know, yesterday Nick cooked some steak last night. It was seasoned with salt. Amen. It was good. I appreciate you, bro. And salt is also used as a preservative to, as a preservative to sustain life. So I have three short points for you guys. We're going we're gonna to run through them. But point number one, find your place at the table. Let's look at Luke. Uh, let's look in, 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 the, in chapter one of Luke 14. It says, on the Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Like wherever Jesus went, eyes were always on him. It says he was carefully watched. Why? He was being carefully watched, therefore, there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Then he asked him, if any one of you has a son or an ox that falls into the well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, uh, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the, uh, the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we see here that the Jews had a problem. And the problem was humility. Because you have a man that, that is in, in distress that comes up to, 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 to this prominent Jew's household for dinner. And everybody's looking at Jesus and looking at his interaction with, with, with the guy who's, who's essentially crippled. And they're like, what, what is he about to do? 
but what, it's the Sabbath. You're not, you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. What are you doing? And Jesus is asking him a question. What, 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 what's more lawful to do on the Sabbath? To heal someone? To do good or to do evil? Wh- which one is it? So he heals the man, and he asks him a simple question. If your child fell in a well on the Sabbath, what are you going to do? Leave him there? Like, like, what are you supposed to do? That's your child. You care about him, so you have to take care of that, that child, right? See, the Pharisees were always looking for a way to trap Jesus because their hearts were so corrupt, they cared more about religion than they cared about people. See, through the Pharisees, there's a couple things that I learned. is that self-righteous, man-focused religion can harden our hearts towards God and towards the people he entrusts us with. The Pharisees had an inflated had inflated egos because of their position in society. Now, w- one of the um, main epicenters of a household is the dinner table. You know, one, one of the things, I, I have a lot of great memories at the dinner table. I remember when I lived in Haiti. Um, uh, for, I lived in Haiti from the time I was 5 to 10 years old. And I, I stayed with my grand, me and my younger sister, we stayed at, at our grandma's house because my mom was working in the U.S. And my dad, because he was a pilot, he was, he was constantly traveling. Uh, but I always remember the, the, the dinner table. And my grandma would always set me, for some reason, at the head of the table. My sister would be at my right, and then she would be at my left. And it's, it was like that every single day. I don't know why it was like that, but it was always like that. And, you know, sometimes as a spoiled kid, you know, you, you, you want to eat certain things. And other things you don't want to eat. And one of the things I, I hated growing up, eating sauspoa and, and rice. And if, it, if you don't know what sauspoa is, it's a bean sauce. And it's black. And when I first saw it, I thought it was ugly. I didn't like it. But I, my grandma would not let me leave that table until that plate was cleaned up. Amen. But I, I always think about the conversations we would have. And when my mom and dad would come home and we were all together, guys, it was incredible. My dad was at the head of the table. I was on the side, and my mom was on the other side, and my grandma was, 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 was to the left and my sister to the right. And I would always remember just, just being in that family, just busting down my food. But they, we'd always be looking at each other, talking, fellowshipping, and having fun. But in, in the society, just to give you some historical context, when you went to a dinner, at, 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 especially when it comes to someone who's prominent in the society, where you sat at the table said something about your status. So where a person sat during a feast or in the synagogue was very important to the Jews. It was considered a display of an individual's social status. So they considered very carefully where they sat at the table. So Jesus tells these guys, hey, hey, you know what? When you're coming into, when you're invited to a wedding, take the lowly place. Because if you take the place of honor and somebody more prominent and of higher status comes up and the host has to tell you, hey, I'm going to need you to get up and go over there, you're going to be pretty embarrassed. Can you imagine, like, my, my dad comes home and I'm sitting here at the head of the table and my dad's like, what, what are you doing? Get, sit here. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's, that's humbling, right? But Jesus simply says, hey, find your proper place at the table. And what's crazy is that God was among them, and these guys were looking to sit at the head in the prominent places. The issue is they didn't recognize Jesus as the Lord he is, the king that he is. So Jesus tells them, hey, you know, somebody more prominent than you is here. Be humble. My question is, is Jesus prominent in your life? Do you recognize his lordship over your life? Because if you don't, God has a plan to humble you. And and verse 7 through 8 says, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. Guys, I can only imagine how embarrassing it would be. You know, even if if it was my own house, I walk in, Jesus is there, and I sit at the head of the table looking down at Jesus. And then he's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, I'd have to be like, bro, I'm sorry, God. Please forgive me. In James chapter 4, verse 6, you don't have to turn there. It says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Now, how do we do that? It takes an honest and proper assessment 
of who we are in the eyes of God. James 4 verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. See, Jesus is the head of our table as Christians. So we got to recognize that in our daily lives, what that means. That means in any situation you find yourself, in any setting you find yourself, take on the role as a servant and let God lift you up to a higher position. Yeah. Humility always allows us to honor, uh, to be honored by God in, 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 in the way he desires. Humility also frees us from our self-serving attitude and mindset. It allows us to focus on giving more to others without any expectations. Why was Jesus able to heal this man on the Sabbath regardless of what, what eyes were on him? It's because his heart was to serve and to give. Where others were concerned about their status, how they looked, and, what, and, and their religiosity. Let's take a look at verse 12 to 14. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus tells these guys, stop inviting your prominent friends. Stop throwing these parties for all of these people for you to show off how awesome you are. But instead, why don't you go serve the people that need it most? See, when we don't have a proper assessment of who we are, we fail to carry out the righteousness that God desires from each and every one of us. Humility to serve, to give. You know why? Because it, you, you, you invite your prominent friends, they're going to be like, oh, okay, cool, cool, I'm going to throw you a better party. Come on in. And then it's like you're keeping up with the Joneses. But you give to somebody who's lowly, struggling, destitute. You feed the homeless. You give them clothes. You care for them. They can't repay you back. There's no glory in it for you. But guess what? God gets glory because he sees it. And who knows how you can change someone's life through your service and your humility. Find your proper place at the table. You know, I'm going to share a little bit about my sin. Amen. You know, um, as, a, as, a, as a Christian um, in God's kingdom, one of the things I constantly struggle with is this desire to be lifted up, this desire to be honored for the things that I do. You know, I'm, I, and, and it corrupts my motivations because now it's not about God getting the glory. It's about Muhammad getting the glory. It's about looking good in front of people. Oh, man, Muhammad has it all together. He never struggles. Um, and, and one of the things that God had to do time and time again he had to press on me for me to recognize who I am before him. So for you guys, humility, compassion, and love is what will give you the reward that you desire in heaven. Not, not being lifted up in front of man, not being honored in front of mankind, but this heart of service and giving to others without any expectation. Be sure to take your proper place at the table. Point number two, dinner's ready. Let's look at verse 15 in Luke chapter 14. It says, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said, Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a, a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to all those who had been invited. Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, 
Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and, and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. You know, those who know me well know that my love language is food. I personally believe that food is a love language. I don't know if you ever read the book, The Five Love Languages. They need to add a six, and that's food. <laughs> and, but, but, the th- but the funny thing about me is, like, I don't really enjoy cooking. Honestly, the, the only time I enjoy cooking is when I'm cooking for other people because I get to show off. <laughs> so that's the only time I love cooking. But I also love when, when people taste the food that I'm in there and, and I, you see the joy in everything. There's just like an excitement in serving people in that way. But I, if you ask the brothers, my dilemma is always this. I'll come home, I'm hungry, and it's either I get up and go buy food or I get up and make something. Either way, I don't like it. <laughs> So most of the time I'm talking to the brothers, man, I'm hungry, but I don't want to go get food. I'm hungry, but I don't want to cook. <laughs> right? But then we have the father here. He's, you know, God prepares this great banquet, and he's super fired up. He says, hey, go call the people who are invited and bring them on in. What's amazing about Israel is that they were God's chosen people. They were the invi- They were the first guests to be invited into this banquet. But what was the issue? The issue is that they became obstinate and contemptuous towards God. Because as long as they did a couple of acts, they didn't have to necessarily give their whole heart. And they can just go on about their day with the confidence that God chose them. So, so in 16 verse 17, it says, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. But when it was ready, he calls the, the invited guests to come on in. And guess what they started doing? They started to make excuses. Now, I can only imagine what God was feeling in this moment. That he prepared all of this for the people that he loves the most. The people that he chose And they began to make excuses. Now, I imagine if I invited some friends over to dinner and I spent my time whipping up in the kitchen and they don't show up, I'm going to be upset. I'm like, what am I supposed to do with all this food? Bro, I spent three hours. Sis, I spent three hours cooking. You better come over and get your plate. (laughs) Somebody's going to eat this food. (laughs) And it better be you. (laughs) But but, but God's heart is like, man, he, he, he. He doesn't allow his frustration to, 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 to overwhelm him. Instead, he invites those who really understand what he's done for them. Again, you see him go to the streets, to the poor, to the needy, to the crippled, to the lame. And they all showed up. And he says, there's still room. And then he tells the servant, go out. My house will be filled. God's desire is that everyone shows up to the dinner table. Can you imagine having a family and one of your little ones says, I'm not showing up for dinner? (laughs) If you're a dad, you know. (laughs) But, But can you imagine that? We don't show up to dinner. But sometimes we do that in our hearts. We become contemptuous of God's kingdom. And we say, you know what? I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to come up to the meetings of the body. I don't want to do what it takes to live like Jesus. Because it's too hard. You're right. It is hard. That's why God says he's going to walk with you. That's why he says he's going to be with you. But we allow these excuses to creep in. So I made a list of some excuses that we get to make for God, right? And, and this is my favorite because this is the one I'm guilty of. Um, I'm too busy. <laughs> too busy for God? Then you need to drop something. <laughs> I'll do it later. A- any procrastinators out there? <laughs> I'll do it later. I have kids. I'm married. I have kids to say, I-, I can't give all of my heart to Jesus. I can't, I can't go and serve. I can't go and preach the gospel. I'm too busy. 
school. I have too much homework, guys. You, you don't get it. I have too much homework. I have to turn in this paper tonight at midnight. And you're just starting this morning when you had three weeks to get it done. Amen. I, I'm guilty of this too. I, I, I'm just, hey, guys, I'm being open. I'm being real. Okay. All right. This is another one. I have work. Now, what's interesting about all of the excuses these guys made, they're pretty valid. I got married. I just bought a field. Um, I, you know, I, I just bought some oxen that I got to go try out. You know why it's valid? Because they did not recognize God as God. But when you recognize God as God, what excuse can you make? What valid excuse can you present to God? We're talking about the creator of the universe who wants to give and provide and protect for you. What excuses are, are we making today? But God's heart, however, is to reconcile his children and have fellowship with them. In 23, he says, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. He says, go and compel people. You know what compelling means? It means you push them. You go after them relentlessly and tell them, you must come in. There's no excuse. You've got to show up to God's house. Dinner is ready. Come eat. There's no excuse that can be made. So we must compel. And, and it, the funny thing that I, I find sometimes with, with a lot of people is like, why are you trying to force me to walk like Jesus? Well, it says compel you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you a compelling reason to make it to heaven. The thing that we got to recognize is people are lost and Jesus is, Jesus died for them. So we, it's not a choice. It's a matter of being obedient to God and say, hey, I am going to share with people. I'm going to call them because God has prepared this incredible banquet. I hope my favorite food is at the table. <laughs> I don't know what he has prepared, but if there's some legume, God, Amen. <laughs> The question is, will you, will you make it to dinner? Because those who reject God's invitation will have no part in his banquet in heaven. Dinner is ready. Come prepared to feast with the Father. And our last and final point, more salt, please. Let's, let's look in uh, verse 25. And, and, and yeah, Luke chapter 14, verse 25. It says, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way... Any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, this is one of the, I, I would say, probably one of the most challenging passages for all of us. Because Jesus not only expresses that, hey, he has to be the number one relationship that we value. But he also says, you have to give up everything. And I don't know about you guys, giving up everything is hard. It's difficult. Wait, 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 God, I have a dream. I have to give up my dream. Wait, 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 God, I have a plan for my life. You're telling me I have to give up my plans? God, I, I have a card. Do I have to give that up too? 
What, what, about, what about my bank account? I have to give that up? Well, my question to you is, what's everything? What's everything you have? The shirt on your back? I mean, a lot of you guys look good. I mean, the sisters are radiant. The brothers are looking handsome. Some of you guys are wearing ties and suits. I'm like, dang, I feel underdressed. But guess what? That belongs to God too. So why is that so important? Well, at the end he says, you're meant to be salt. You are meant to preserve what I've given and entrusted to you. Salt represents loyalty and faithfulness. In order for us to become the salt of the earth, as it says in Matthew 5.13, we need to become sold out disciples of Jesus. That means we have to strip ourselves of all the tethers that bind us here. Why? Because when you have an abundance of possession, it's hard to move. One of the things that I hate the most is moving. And every time I move, I'm like, why do I have all this stuff? Like, I don't even use this. Where did this shirt come from? I haven't seen it in like 10 years. What's it doing here? Like, without fail, this is my struggle when I'm, when I'm ready to move out. I'm like, man, I want to throw all this stuff away. <laughs> like, whatever doesn't fit in the car has to go in the garbage. But guys, our things, the things that we possess bind us. They keep us anchored in the same place. And Jesus says, you're meant to be salt. You have to go season people's lives. You're meant for something greater. And right now you're tied down and you're not flexible enough to move. And sold out Christians are ready to move when the spirit is ready to move. But if you're anchored down, you can't move. We have to have a love for Jesus that surpasses our love for anything else in this world including friends or family. I, and, and that's hard, guys. I mean, think about, look at all the people he listed. I, I, like, he says, hate your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Well, guys, he's not literally saying hate them, okay? He says love less. Because if you don't love Jesus above all of those relationships and things that you have, You cannot have the relationship with God that he desires to have with you. And sadly, too many of us are influenced by the relationships that we have rather than the word of God. So decisions we make are based on emotion and what mom and dad says, what what, what our girlfriend or boyfriend says, or what so-and-so says. Rather than looking in God's word and says, no, I'm going to stand for what Jesus says. And that's a, that's, a, that's a tall order, guys. Because why? We love our family. And we should. We should love our family. But if we love Jesus first, we take care of our family the way Jesus desires for them to take care of them. Why is salt so important in this reference? Now, Salt was a very valued mineral. So when Jesus was talking about salt, everybody understood what he was talking about. As a matter of fact, soldiers and even laborers during this time would get paid in salt because salt was that valuable of of a mineral. You could use salt as currency because it was so scarce. And, And if you guys don't know, there are parts of the world that have health issues because they don't have salt. Yeah. And 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 they understood how valuable salt was. It it was to preserve food. To preserve life. And people valued salt tremendously. You ever heard the term, are you worth your salt? That comes because, hey, I'm paying you in salt. Are you worth the payment that I'm about to give you? Because this is a precious mineral right here. So my question for you today is, are you worth your salt? Salt is costly. It's rare. It preserves life and it purifies. See, as disciples, we are the uh, preserving agent that propels the gospel forward. So we must have a pure devotion to God that is unhindered by desire, not hindered by desires for other things. See, when salt is mixed with other minerals, it becomes diluted and loses its flavor. 
So when your salt is mixed up with all these things in the world, you're diluted. So when you're mixed in and caught up by the things of the world, you lose your saltiness. And, and, and God says, man, when you lose your saltiness, how can you be made salty again? See, if we are to live a life that leads to eternity and help others receive salvation, we're going to need more salt. So I have a couple practicals for you guys. The first thing is clothe yourself with humility. What does that mean? Well, write down Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. It's about serving other people and looking for the interests of other people above yourself. Make a list of things that are challenging for you to let go of. And, and be, be honest about that list. Make, make that list and study the word of God. Get discipling, get help from another brother or sister to, to help you let those things go. And pray until you let it go. Don't pray for you have the heart to let it go. No, no. Pray until you let it go. That means you've made the decision to let it go and you will. Too many times, guys, I pray about things that are right. God, help me obey. Instead of making the decision to obey. It's a decision. Let go. And be salty. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're going to put a new twist to that, right? <laughs> you, humility is the only way we'll have the compassion and the love necessary to serve and to give to others in a way that glorifies God. Find your place at the table. There's no excuse for us to miss out on God's goodness and love. Dinner is ready. Let us give up everything so that we can make it to heaven and take as many people with us. More salt, please, to God be the glory. <laughs> right, can't, can't, can't keep it out, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> uh, well, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I can't keep it to myself. But I can't keep it to myself. But I can't keep it to myself. Well, I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I can't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, oh, yeah. You ought to have been there. When he saved my soul, you ought to have been there. When he wrote my name on the road, when I started talking, I started talking and I started singing. I started shouting what the Lord has done for me, oh yeah. Well, I said I wasn't going to sing about it, but I can't keep it to myself. But I but I can't keep it Oh, well, I said I wasn't going to about it, but I can't keep it to myself. Lord has done for me. Oh, yeah, you ought to have been there when he saved my soul. You ought to have been there when he wrote my name on the road. When I started walking, I started talking, and I started singing, I started shouting. Lord has done for me, oh yeah. Well, I said I wasn't gonna preach about it, but I can't keep it to myself. But I can't keep it to myself. No, but I can't keep it to myself. Well, I said I wasn't gonna preach about it, but I can't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, oh yeah. You ought to have been there when He saved my soul. You ought to have been there. <laughs> When he wrote my name on the road, when I started walking, I started talking and I started singing, I started shouting what the Lord has done for me, oh yeah. 
Well, I said I wasn't going to shout about it, but I can't keep it to myself. But I can't keep it to myself. But I can't keep it to myself. Well, I said I wasn't going to shout about it, but I can't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me. Oh, yeah. You ought to been there when he saved my soul. You ought to been there. When he wrote my name on the road, when I started walking, I started talking, I started singing, and I started shouting what the Lord has done for me, oh yeah.